Let me now invite you to give attention to the reading of God's word this morning from Psalm 48. Hear now the word of the Lord. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we are privileged to hear from Pastor Eric Chappelle. He is someone that I would consider a friend that I don't get to hang out with enough. Eric is married to his amazing wife, Katie, who is here with him this morning, as well as their three children. They live in Vista, California, and Eric is currently planting a church in the coastal North County of San Diego area called El Camino Presbyterian. He fits in really well there because, of course, he coaches at a local CrossFit gym, dabbles in mountain biking, and can surprise you on any given week with the variety of facial hair and how he has carved it for that week. Now, I should also let you know that when I texted Eric earlier this week as to him preaching for us, he responded with, oh, is that this Sunday? Now, I don't say that to besmirch his great name and for how unorganized he is. It's quite the opposite. As the clerk of our presbytery, he's very organized. He just wanted to give me a mild heart attack on a Thursday, knowing that I probably didn't have enough time to prepare a sermon in order to fill in for him. So with that lovely introduction, let me welcome Eric Chappelle to come and bless us with teaching this morning. Please give him a warm welcome. Good to be with you all again. Uh, One of the things that's interesting to me about Christianity is uh, this theme that you see, if you're familiar with the Christian faith or with the church, uh, this idea of God dwelling with humanity, God dwelling with people. If you know the plot line of the Bible, of the scriptures, you know that uh, the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, uh, God is, 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 he creates a world and he, he dwells with his creation, with people, Uh, in a garden, and then if you move all the way to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation, uh, there you you have this astounding picture, this vision of God once again dwelling with people in a a city. And that's exactly what Psalm 48, uh, which we just heard read, uh, is about. That's what this psalm, this ancient poem, is all about. You maybe have had the experience, I imagine, as I have, of uh, you put on a shirt or some article of clothing, and uh, you notice sort of there's a dangling thread hanging off, and you, you begin to pull it, and it sort of just keeps going, and pretty soon your shirt is unraveling. Uh, if that's ever happened to you, um, you know sort of the, 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 how all the fabric is woven together uh, based on that one strand, that thread. Uh, and that's, that's really what Psalm 48 is. If you begin to trace that thread and pull on that strand uh, of these poetic expressions in the Bible about the city of God or Jerusalem or Mount Zion, you've come to find out that this is actually what Christianity is all about, Uh, that you're connected to something immense and incredible. That's Psalm 48, which we're going to look at um, this morning. 
So I wanna, what, I, what I want us to do is just take a few moments this morning and look at kind of three threads that come out of this ancient poem that actually tie into and connect the whole narrative, the whole storyline of the Bible. And what I hope we discover together is that actually far from being a, an ancient poem that was about the ancient city of Jerusalem, far away in the Middle East, um, Psalm 48 is actually this astounding, breathtaking vision into a reality that if you see it, if you catch a glimpse of it, as it were, it gives you amazing, incredible, deep, profound resources for life here and now in 2022. So we're just going to look at three threads, three themes that come out of this poem. First is uh, the thread or the theme of a beautiful presence. And then second, we're going to look at a terrifying security. And then third, an infinite hope. So a beautiful presence, a terrifying security, and an infinite hope. I just said that Psalm 48 is not really, it's not really about the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Let me explain, because it both is and it isn't. Uh, See, for the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Israelites, Psalm 48 which sung about the glories of Zion or the city of God. Sometimes it's called the city of David. Certainly it grew out of their experience of the ancient city of Jerusalem. Proof of that is in verse 9, if you have your Bible or a Bible app, where the, the poet says that we have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. That reference to the temple is significant. Because the temple, if you know anything about Jerusalem, was at the high point of the city in Jerusalem. Every Israelite knew that. But as the poem was read, I hope that you began to perhaps catch glimpses or clues or little hints that there's actually something more profound going on here. For example, in verse 2, This mountain city in Psalm 48 is described in the far north. It says that this city, this mountain, is in the far north. And for the Israelites, the far north wasn't actually in Jerusalem. If you know the geography of Israel and the ancient world, uh, Jerusalem was actually in what they viewed as the south. Uh, Then the poet describes Jerusalem as being beautiful in elevation. So I was wondering... how, how high is Jerusalem? And I you know, Googled it. How high is this mountain? It's actually only 2,000 feet, which is, if you've got kids, that's like a Saturday, that's like an easy hike that my daughter would do in flip-flops. Um, it's not actually that high. It's not actually that beautiful in elevation. Uh, then Jerusalem is described as the joy of all the earth and a city that will be established forever. And the question is, what's, what's going on? What is this poet talking about? If you knew anything about the ancient city of Jerusalem, none of these things would actually be true. You might just chalk that sort of poetic expression to kind of sort of a nationalistic zeal or pride, sort of poetic hyperbole. But if you read this poem, Psalm 48, in the larger context of the whole Bible, which is certainly how it's meant to be understood and read... There's this kind of dizzying and dazzling truth that I think is put on display, and it's this. Jerusalem was actually a picture of something far more glorious, far more grand, far more wonderful. See, Jerusalem was meant to be a picture of God's dream, of God's vision, of God's plan to dwell with humanity, to dwell with you and me. And that thread is introduced right at the very beginning of the Bible. The creator God designs and fashions a world that is teeming with life and potential and happiness. And he makes people to glorify and enjoy him through experiencing the things that he made. And what's interesting is that in the very beginning in Genesis, God plants a garden at the the very center of creation where he could be known and experienced. Uh, So if you go back and read Genesis, you find out that it's not the whole place that's a garden. There's actually a a unique spot in the center of everything where God plants a garden where he uh, is supposed to meet with his people. And that was called the Garden of Eden, which you're probably familiar with. And the role of Adam and Eve, the role of humanity, was actually to expand the, 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 the precincts of that garden 
until they covered the whole earth. So in Genesis, you have this idea introduced that the transcendent God's beautiful presence can be accessed by people in very specific certain places. And that's the realm or the kind of the God dimension, the dimension of God that was available to people, but only in specific spots. I was trying to wrap my head around sort of how do I communicate this, sort of this idea that God can be accessed only in specific locations, because that's what Psalm 48 is getting at. That's what Genesis is talking about. Um, And I was thinking it's sort of, it's kind of like the internet. Uh, I've spent, I've got three young kids We've spent a number of days at the beach uh, this summer, and I don't know if it's the beach or my cell phone provider or what, but whenever I get to the beach, it's like the bars just go down. There's no internet service, Um, and oftentimes I find myself at the beach, and I'm getting a little bored just watching my kids, and I want to access the interwebs. Uh, I want to just sort of scroll through social media, Uh, but I need to be in the right spot. I need a hot spot, right? Um, And that's effectively what Eden was. It's what Jerusalem was. They were the hot spots of God's presence. They were the places, they were the spots where God could be accessed, where the creator could be experienced and enjoyed. Verse 3 says this. It says that within Jerusalem's citadels, God has made himself known. The point is this. We were made, you and I were made, to dwell with, to experience, to enjoy the presence of God. We were made to see the face of God. We were made to share in the delights and the joys and the life of God. That's, that's the first thread. That's the beautiful presence, the idea of the beautiful presence. But if you look at verses 4 through 7, you see that actually God's presence isn't beautiful to everyone. Uh, that's verses 4 through 7. It's, it's not enjoyed by everyone. Uh, for some, God's presence is actually threatening. There's this account in verses 4 through 7. It's not clear from the poem what event inspired it. But there's this recollection from the poet of this kind of political coalition that at one point conspired to make an assault on the city of God, on the city of Jerusalem. And we read in the poem, even before the battle commences, this gathering of kings, this sort of political cohort is thrown into a panic. They're left, as the poet says, in the anguish of a woman giving birth. Now, if you know the history of Jerusalem, uh, if you know anything about the city of Jerusalem, you know that throughout history, it's been overthrown over and over and over again by political regimes, by different kings and empires. And none of those empires actually saw Jerusalem as a threat. Uh, Not the Babylonians, not the Romans. Uh, There was nothing about the citadels of Jerusalem that would have provoked fear or dread on any human army of any stature at all. So the question is, what's actually happening? What is this poet describing? And the answer is, what he's describing is God. God is the one who provokes fear and dread amongst these kings. See, the very thing that inspires wonder and joy in verse 2 is the thing that elicits dread and trembling in verses 5 to 6. And as I was reflecting on that, I actually sort of remembered a a similar instance where those opposite reactions, those opposing reactions, occur elsewhere in the Bible, but actually at a different mountain. So the book of Exodus is the historical account of God delivering the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt in order to dwell with them in the promised land. There's that theme of dwelling with people. And after God's rescue of his people out of Egypt, he brings them to a mountain, what we know, uh, many of us know as Mount Sinai, to meet with him. And God's presence descends onto this mountain And the result, as we read in in Exodus, is lightning and thunder and fire and smoke and an earthquake. It's terrifying. And the people uh, that are at the base of the mountain are warned not even to touch the mountain because the presence of God, it's sort of, the the idea is that the presence of God kind of emits this lethal radiation. 
And the Israelites' experience of that raw, unmediated presence of God that resulted in lightning and fire and an earthquake was actually crippling to them. It was unbearable. It was terrifying. But Moses, who was the leader of the people of Israel, Moses actually asks for more of the presence. Moses acts to, he, he says, I want to experience more of the glory presence of God. See, Moses knew something that this poet in Psalm 48 knew. He knew that God's presence was a fortress. That's what the poet says in verse 3. And that God's, the manifestation of his glory, the manifestation of his presence was a guide through the worst that life could throw at you. That's verse 14. There's something about the presence of God that needs to guide his people. Moses knew that if there was going to be any chance of success, if Israel was going to go into the promised land to dwell with God, God would have to guide them. He would have to dwell with them throughout that entire journey. And so what God did was he created a, 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 a sort of a traveling temple that they called the tabernacle. It was a movable sanctuary, a movable hot spot where God's presence could be mediated to the people. And we don't have time to look at this, but if you look closely at the, the tabernacle and the temple later in the Old Testament, uh, some of the design and the furnishings and the features of that tabernacle, they evoked uh, the imagery and um, the artistry of the Garden of Eden. It was the place where heaven and earth met. It was the portal, it was the hot spot to the God dimension, to the reality of God, where you could know God and experience him. Now back to the original question. Why was this glorious, beautiful God perceived as threatening, both by ancient Israel and by this coalition of kings? Um, C.S. Lewis of, of Narnia fame also wrote a science fiction trilogy called the Space Trilogy. Uh, and in the second book, which is called Paralandra, there's a scene where the narrator encounters this being on the planet Mars. This is science fiction, so you gotta run with it. Uh, and this being that, he, that the narrator encounters on Mars is a being of absolute goodness. And what the narrator discovers, what he finds, is to his, to his disappointment, is that he's actually threatened by the goodness of this uh, sort of alien life form. Listen to how he describes it. He says, this is a very terrible experience. As long as what you are afraid of is something evil, you may still hope that the good may come to your rescue. But suppose that you struggle through to the good and you find that is also dreadful. How if food itself turns out to be the very thing that you can't eat and home the very place you can't live and your very comforter, the person who makes you uncomfortable, then indeed there is no rescue possible. The last card has been played. I wanted it to go away. I wanted every possible distance and gulf and curtain, blanket and barrier to be placed between it and me. What C.S. Lewis is describing through that narrator in Paralandra is the reality that these kings and the people of Israel also experienced. That the thing that was supposed to bring them happiness and joy and beauty and life brought fear. The thing that was supposed to make them comfortable, to give them everlasting comfort, actually made them uncomfortable, to put it mildly. The thing that was supposed to bring them life actually turned out to be lethal to them. Why? I think the clue is found in verses 9 through 11, where the poet says, We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. See, the answer is found in the temple. See, in the midst of the temple, literally right in the middle, was the Ark of the Covenant. It was the ultimate, you could say it was the ultimate hot spot of God's presence. It was a golden box where inside you found the Ten Commandments as well as a number of other ancient articles from the people of Israel. And those Ten Commandments were a description of the goodness that was required to be in the presence of the ultimate goodness that is God. 
And that was a requirement you had to fulfill. Otherwise, that lethal radiation of God's presence would incinerate you. And you know, we have this image of the ark. Um, I think it's mostly kind of made famous by the Indiana Jones film, uh, which rightly so, it's an amazing movie. Um, that the ark was sort of this shimmering, golden-laden, sparkling artifact. But if you know the history of the ark, uh, you know that once a year, this golden box was uh, splattered with the blood of a sacrifice. That the ark of the covenant, as it was, it was, it was referred to, was stained all over with the blood of a substitute. So it wasn't this golden, shimmering, dazzling thing. It was actually covered in blood. And the message that that communicated to people was that in order to encounter God's presence, you needed something to cover you. You needed a blanket, you needed a barrier or a curtain to shield you. And friends, if you know anything about Christianity, you know that that right there is Jesus. In the New, in the New Testament, we're told that Jesus dwelt with us. He tabernacled with us. His followers saw his glory and through his glory came to know the living God. They saw the glory presence. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, that all the dazzling radiation of God was housed in the person of Jesus. And in John 2, Jesus says the most astounding thing. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. What he was saying was, I am the temple. I'm the place where heaven and earth meet. I am the portal. I am the hot spot. I am the gateway to the reality of God, to the enjoyment of God. Verse 11 is shocking. Uh, if you know the terrifying reality of God, how, can, how in the world could you possibly rejoice, as this psalm says, let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. If you, know, if you really know the presence of God, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, the justice of God, why would anyone in the world be glad or rejoice in that unless, friends, unless that in Jesus Christ, the true tabernacle, the true Ark of the Covenant, the faithful, unending mercy of God, the faithful, unending love of God has been revealed once for all. So that the righteousness and justice and holiness and presence of God is actually no longer a threat that throws you into a panic, but instead a security where you can find shelter, a fortress where you're secure. How can you experience the beautiful presence of God? Friends, it's through the terrifying security of the cross of Jesus. It's at the cross where you see Jesus, the true temple of God, endure all of the lethal radiation of God's justice so that you and I could dwell secure, so that we could find forever the steadfast love of God. And because of that steadfast love, there's an infinite hope. There's an infinite hope, a forever hope. That's the third and final thread. You know, there's, this still, there's still this idea that persists in Christianity and the church, if you're familiar with the church or grew up in the church, that Christianity is about going to heaven when you die. And it's not. It's that God, through Christ, has blown a hole through the barrier between heaven and earth. Our hope isn't sort of escape, isn't trying to chase after and secure as much as we can, only to lose it in death. Our hope is that actually everything that happened to Jesus, has happened, is happening, and will happen to you and to me. That means something incredibly mind-blowing. If Jesus is the final temple, if he's the temple to end all temples, is he, if he's the tabernacle to end all tabernacles, the place where heaven and earth meet, then you, Christian, you too are the final temple. Peter in the New Testament says that you are actually living stones in the temple of God. If Jesus is the gate, if he's the portal to God's dimension, then that means that you too, if you are looking to Jesus, are connected. You're linked to heaven for all eternity. 
If Jesus is the great high priest who connects us to God, then that means that you too, Christian, are priests who can draw near to God and bring other people to God. That means that you right now and tomorrow, Monday morning, carry the life and the light and the glory presence of God with you. So what do you do? The question is, what do you do do with that? If that's true, if you are the temple, if you are a, a priest of God who carries the light and the life and the presence of God with you, what do you do? Well, you work in your garden. You learn about God's word in school. You enjoy creation through play and Sabbath. You cultivate meaningful relationships and friendships. You work in the lab or in your home or in the office to the glory of God. You get married and you serve Jesus by serving your spouse. You stay single and dedicate time to the kingdom. You do justice to the poor and the widow and the orphan. You get to know your neighbor and their name and their story and you pray for them. You maybe care for a pet. You start a family and you teach kids about Jesus. You serve the local church. You build something well or you maybe fix broken things. There's a million different things that you are now free to do because you carry the life and the joy and the presence of God with you wherever you go. And you say, but I don't feel like that. I don't feel like my work matters. I don't feel like my uh, role in the home is significant. I don't feel like God's presence is with me. I don't feel like I'm uh, part of a final temple, that I'm a living stone in this astounding, dazzling uh, creation of God. And the question is, who cares about what you feel? You are the temple of God in Christ. It's all true. He's with you now, wherever you go, whatever you do. And you don't think that the God of the cosmos, the God of all creation will accomplish his purpose in your life? Friend, he will whether you feel like it or not. But most of all, uh, most of all, as God's temple people, let me encourage you to week in, week out, come back here. This might not feel like a temple, but whenever the people of God are gathered together, it is. You are that temple. And you can't be that temple, you can't be that priest apart from your brothers and sisters here, apart from the family of God. So would you come back here week in, week out, and again be reminded and refreshed and renewed in the steadfast love of God? Would you hear week in and week out the words spoken over you in the gospel, in your baptism at the table of the Lord that says, you are my child, in you I am well pleased. See, Psalm 48 is about the security of the presence of God. God dwelling with his people and them being secure in him. Can you imagine a more f- a firmer, more stable, more lasting, enduring security? You won't find that in your academic pedigree. You won't find it in resumes. You won't find it in your kids. You won't find it in the job or relationship that you're chasing. You won't find it in the dream home. You'll find it in the steadfast love of God. It's more than enough to guide you forever and ever. That's verse 14. In my opinion, the translation is a little bit off, um, in the ESV at least. It says, what it literally says is, he is our guide through death. He's our guide through death. See, you and I need a security and a hope that even if it looks destroyed, even if you're staring death in the face, you know that on the other side there's resurrection life and resurrection hope forever and ever. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we were made to experience and enjoy your face forever. We lost it because of sin. And now we flee from you trying to find significance and security in things which ultimately are not enough. Would you today seal us in the enoughness of Jesus Christ. Would you give us by your spirit the infinite hope of resurrection life in your triune presence? This is your dream from the beginning and it will be accomplished. So we pray that you would make it so. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.